Hello, everyone. My name is Jen Braun, and I direct the AHA team training program here at the American Hospital Association. Welcome to the first webinar of 2023 on applying human centered design to healthcare. This is part one of a three part uh, webinar series focusing on human centered design thinking, a technique that you'll become familiar with um, and will be able to apply to your own work with your own teams. So our speakers from Do Tank are amazing. Um, and before I hand it off to them, I'd like to go over a few rules of engagement and announcements. Um, so I think by now we're pretty well seasoned with Zoom, um, but just to close the loop here, uh, you can access audio by listening in through your computer speakers or through your phone. If you're having issues, you should be able to access the toolbar at the bottom to switch to either phone or computer audio. Uh, please note they are in a listen only mode. And so all hyperlinks that you'll see um, on the web page or on the slides are live. Uh, so you can click on that and open that. Carol, my colleague, will also be chatting them in via the chat pod. And then finally, I'll moderate a Q&A session at the end with our speaker. So if you have any questions, please chat them in throughout the presentation. If it's technical or logistical, we'll answer it in the moment. But if it's for our speakers, we will save it for the end. So moving on, we're happy to offer free CEs for our, our webinars. And so in order to claim your CE credit, you must create a Duke OneLink account. Duke is our CE provider. So this creating of creating the Duke OneLink account is just a one-time only setup. And so my um, colleague Carol will be chatting in those instructions. And you can also refer to the email that was sent to you this morning that has instructions as well. Following the webinar today, please text the code um, LEVKOF uh, -E to the number you see there on the screen. We'll be sharing that information throughout the webinar today and at the end. Uh, so moving on, uh, we uh, this webinar is really timely because um, as we announce an open registration for our in-person master training courses for the first half of the year, we're happy to share that we have made enhancements to the curriculum that incorporate similar design thinking principles that you'll learn about today. So if you attend one of our in-person courses at any of the locations that you see there, you'll get to see how we've included this really effective approach to better understand not only the patients we serve, but the people we work with. And so our updated curriculum focuses on helping teams of our participants take a deeper dive on the why. So why are they there looking to improve team performance? So we spend time better understanding people and processes involved or impacted by the why, along with mapping out both strategic and tactical team steps implementation plans. So registration is now open for these courses. Please keep in mind that attending in teams is highly, highly encouraged. Um, and we have team discounts, so you can check out the course webpage for more details. If you're looking for a more customized training solution, we offer on-site trainings where we come to your organization to deliver anything from a two-day Team Steps Master training course to comprehensive training programs that span multiple on-site trainings and virtual coaching to really support your implementation efforts and foster ownership and sustainability um, at your organization. Um, and this allows us as a side note, to customize the content to your audience. So if, for instance, you're focusing in on labor and delivery, where we would include case examples, videos, et cetera, related to that area. Or if you've already implemented other key quality improvement initiatives like um, Just Culture or HROs, we can incorporate that into the curriculum and really meet you where you are. So you can visit our website to learn more about those opportunities. So. Finally, um, in terms of our webinars, we have two more webinars led by DoTank that will focus on design thinking that you can register for and attendance for all of these webinars are not required so you can sign up for them individually. So with that, I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Uh, we have Matt uh, Kelly and Adam uh, Kolaris from DoTank. They've been great partners with ours. And like I mentioned, they helped with the curriculum refresh for the master training course. And you'll hear a little bit more about that. So I'll turn it over to Matt and Adam. All right. Thanks, Jen. And, and thanks to the HA for, for having us. You know, you, you know, you guys have been an amazing partner through the years. And uh, the team steps thing that, uh, you know, the updated curriculum and stuff that Jen was just talking about, uh, we've had the, the opportunity to be part of that. So there's cool new design canvases and interactions. So even if you're an alum of a previous version of it, uh, you should check it out. I, th I think it's uh, I think it's pretty cool. Um, great. So I'll introduce myself. I'll kick it over to you, Adam, and then 
and then we'll get flying. So my name's Matt. Um, I'm a partner and business designer with Dutank. We've been around as a group since 2014, and healthcare is our biggest space. You know, it's been a really great fit for us, and we've had the the privilege to work with health systems, associations, and community-based organizations and all kinds of groups. So today, you know, we're really going to share some of those case studies, some of those tools, so that we hope today's a real session that you can take some stuff away. So we're really excited to be here. Uh, Adam. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as, as Matt said, my name is Adam Kloris. Uh, my background is in quality improvement, patient safety. I spent 10 plus years as an assistant vice president of quality, safety, and health policy. Uh, and I was one of those mid-careerists who discovered design thinking, visual canvases, and it was like a light bulb that went off in my head. And so uh, since I've discovered uh, this work, I've been working to kind of apply it uh, within healthcare um, alongside Matt. And so uh, we're really excited to share some of those vignettes and case studies with you today. So thank you for joining. All right. So what's this next uh, approximate 50 minutes going to look like? So we've got four kind of main case studies, but peppered throughout it, I think we've got a dozen design tools that we're going to share with you. So um, we're going to move very quickly and we're going to cover a lot of territory. So hopefully just keep your, your mind open. I'm sure not everything will stick, but if a few things kind of land and really resonate with your own personal experience, uh, that would be amazing. So uh, use the chat if you have questions. Hopefully we'll have some time for the Q&A at the end. I'm sharing my screen, but Adam will keep an eye on the chat. So if some things come up, we'll try to address them in, in real time. Also keep an eye on your chat. Um, know the folks from the AHA will post some links and some things as they come up and, and we may post a few things uh, as well. So um, just enjoy the ride and keep an open mind and, and, and I hope you, you like it. So, so fundamentally, like human-centered design, you know, what is it? it I, the thing that, one of the things that's great about it is it, it really does suggest exactly what it says on the label, right? It's keeping the human beings and the people we serve at the center of any initiative process or thing that we design, right? So it's, it may sound like common sense to a lot of folks, but um, a lot of times people start with their capabilities, like what they're good at and what they're trying to achieve. They start with their own motivations, if you will, and then try to figure out how to create something and ultimately voiced it onto the world or at least suggested to you know, their, their stakeholders like what that change might be. Human-centered design is starting with who are the people that we serve? You know, in this healthcare context, it could be clinicians, patients, families, et cetera. So it's starting with an empathetic understanding of the people that we're trying to create value for. And that value could be manifested in terms of products and services, but it can also be like processes and just the way someone enters a building, right? So the the kind of the object of human-centered design or where you apply it does not have to be grandiose. I think sometimes people, when they hear innovation or design, you know, it conjures up images of Silicon Valley or new product launches and that sort of thing. But we're today, we really hope to share with you that it's a powerful mindset and set of very accessible tools that can help with all kinds of ambitions of different sizes and everything like that. So within the clinical environment, without it, et cetera. So, uh, and we really do believe if any industry or any endeavor should be human-centered, it's, it's healthcare, right? Which is trying to aim to improve the quality of life and the health of, of the people that we serve and the people around us. So we think there's a really beautiful fit um, kind of resonance between design uh, and healthcare. So going deeper, what is human-centered design? What are some of the constituent parts? So, and again, a lot of the stuff that we share today, you know, or all of it is gonna come from our own experience, you know? So we'll definitely have, we have a point of view and a perspective on this. So we think that um, design thinking, which is rooted in empathy, which again, starts by saying the people that you serve and the folks, the stakeholders around you, the characters and the drama, however you wanna describe it, it really starts with that empathetic connection with people. Visual thinking and storytelling principles are a huge part of what we do. So design is often applied to projects that ultimately um, aim to convince people of a point of view or perhaps adopt a change, right? So for example, if you've got a quality improvement initiative, it can be elegant, beautiful, and efficient. But if you don't convince people that it's in their interests and that they want to change, it's, it's not gonna do what you want it to do. So the ability to tell stories and create messages that resonate with the audience is absolutely critical. And I'll be very frank, this is often sorely lacking in healthcare, the land of mind numbing slides and crazy stuff. So storytelling is actually a really powerful um, kind of thing that can really set you apart. And then business rigor, and I want to I want to stress here that business rigor doesn't just mean dollars and cents. It doesn't mean the bottom line profit and loss. A business model, the way 
we describe it, borrowing from Alex Osterwalder, is a business model is the rationale for how an organization or team creates, delivers, and captures value. So the idea here is it's not enough just to create a beautiful thing or a lovely process. You need to think about what resources are necessary to fuel it? What key partners are gonna you know, help you on the journey? What are the channels and routes to market? And this could be internal. How are you gonna advertise it on a bulletin board in the lobby or an advertisement during the Super Bowl, right? What are the relationships inherent there? What's the value proposition? So when we say business rigor, what we really mean is thinking holistically about how it functions and how it creates value. And then working at pace. So this is a really big part of the design and innovation process. And, especially I think folks that have a, a scientific background, sometimes they're uncomfortable with things being unfinished or incomplete. Um, but the idea is to have a prototyping mindset to test early ideas and iterations of things so that you can change them and improve them as you go. So a lot of times you'll hear it described that human-centered design is an iterative process. It's fundamentally about understanding the problem that you're trying to tackle, um, designing prototypes and early stage ideas about how you can create value, validating your key assumptions and testing them with your audience and then constantly refining it based on what you learn so you're constantly building refining building refining right so it's an iterative process and if you don't get to action early uh it'll take a while <laughs> so as we mentioned you know this can be applied to very specific disciplines or challenges if you will in the healthcare context so we're going to share a couple of those with you today so first to kind of prime your head a little bit so hopefully this you know you'll get more value out of it we'd like you to have something in mind that's a particular challenge that you face in your own personal day job so it could be you know a change initiative that you're trying to spread it could be a process that's just suboptimal today it's just not working great it can be anything think about a challenge that you face or you know an early stage innovation or idea that you have that you'd like to flesh out and scale. So just think about something in your world where you think some innovative and fresh thinking might help. And then think about the people around it. So we're going to do just a 60 second, just solo reflection to, for you to, to think about that. So think about a challenge you face, something you wish was better. And then think about the cast of characters and the folks involved, who your target audience is. And again, that cast of characters will be more than one persona, right? It could be patients, it could be clinicians, administrators, external partners, right? So just, it's an imaginative exercise. Just try to see a challenge and the colors and sounds of it and the people around it. All right, so thank you for reflecting on this. I know you didn't think you were coming to a meditation, but uh, there you go. Um, so we do think that this is really where um, the innovation really starts, right? It's about framing a challenge, framing a problem, not leading with the solution, but kind of leading with you know what you're trying to, to influence and, and change. So keep that kind of in the back of your head as we go through this presentation for the next you know, 40 odd minutes and see if anything that you hear today could be really applicable, some of the tools that we share, et cetera. So we think that'll help you have that reference point to think about what sticks. Okay, so we're gonna go through four examples, again, highly informed by our own experiences and projects. So Adam, I will be your PowerPoint jockey. So just tell me if I have to go backwards or forwards on slides, but uh, take it away. Lovely. And thank you for that moment of Zen, Matt. We got to do that more. That was really nice. And like a 60 minute packed webinar just to have a few seconds to kind of center. So great. So as Matt said, let me kick us off on first base here. And it's a classic quality improvement example. Uh, this is one that Matt and I put uh, months and months of work into. Uh, and, and honestly, of, of everything we're going to talk about, one of my favorite uh, outcomes that we've seen. And so uh, what we did here with this example uh, was we worked with the State Hospital Association to say, how can we identify, refine, and scale quality improvement 
uh, initiatives or best practices. So those hospitals that we know exist in each state and each region uh, who are bright green on their dashboards for things like falls, sepsis, C. diff readmissions, those high achievers, how can we take the work that they've done and figure out a way to bottle it, scale it, and disseminate it, and transport it into other hospitals or cultures or communities across the state? And so that's exactly what we did with a handful of organizations uh, in Illinois over the course of a couple of years. Um, it, we've got these playbooks. We call them innovation challenge playbooks. They're all available for free for download. I'm going to go ahead and drop in the chat uh, the website where you can get these, and we'll be chatting in a lot of hyperlinks to you today. Uh, but as you will see when you take a look at these, uh, we highlight a gamut of, of outcomes here from readmissions to safety huddles to C. diff to social determinants of health screenings. Uh, so a lot of different stuff. But what I'd like to do is highlight one particular example to give you a sense of the look and feel of these playbooks. And so uh, that's our innovation hub that Matt just flew by that I put in the chat. So feel free to go uh, to that site and, and look at any of these uh, playbooks or other visual canvases that we've got out there. Uh, but I'll start by talking about uh, one of the playbooks we did. And this one was focused on uh, readmissions. And again, when most folks think of an innovation challenge, you think of this new to the world idea. Right. It's almost like the Shark Tank idea of uh, is this really cool and should we fund it and is this going to work and play? And so we had that concept in mind, but most importantly, what we wanted to do was figure out how to scale, spread and disseminate best practice that was already proven. And so we started our challenge a little bit differently by saying, let's identify those mentors, those high performers in a particular clinical area. And then let's identify some mentee hospitals whose dashboards might be red in that area or who need a lot of help there. And let's see how through human-centered design principles, we can translate the best practice into a totally different culture and a different organization across the state. And so that was the concept. And that's kind of the roadmap that we went on. So the next slide is going to show us uh, the first opening salvo of uh, the readmissions playbook that we put together. One thing that's very different about the work we do and what you'll see in these playbooks is that these aren't going to read like uh, ARC guides to reducing readmissions or a CMS checklist of, of best practices. So uh, halfway into my career as a quality improvement professional, I found myself just on webinars like this emailing toolkits and resources to organizations and saying, here's the best practice, good luck, go for it, and hoping that their, their um, dashboards were gonna go from red to green or enhance. And so um, what we did with this playbook was very different than other playbooks or roadmaps or toolkits that you'll find. I wanted this to look and feel and read more like a comic book and a narrative. And so what we did with this playbook uh, two main characters, Dawn and Jennifer. So Dawn on the left is from uh, a large uh, organization on the side of Chicago, 300 plus beds. Jennifer is from a 25 bed critical access hospital uh, in rural Illinois with a population of less than 5,000 folks. And so out of the gate, many folks in the quality improvement specter and in healthcare would say, well, those aren't apples to apples. Their data is not going to be the same. There's no way we can take a process from a Goliath 300 bed organization embed it in a critical access hospital or vice versa. And so there was a challenge there out of the gate that we wanted to disprove. But what we had from Dawn was the best practice. So she was kind of our mentor of hospital. Um, she had proven, and you'll see her numbers, um, how they had reduced readmissions through this process that her team pioneered. Um, and so we spent three months with Dawn, figuring out what that process was, digging into the data, digging into the process, and then figuring out how we could distill it and transfer it to another organization. So that's that's kind of the, the opening scene. Um, as we move on to the next slides, and there's several pages in this playbook. It's only 10 to 12 pages though. Um, these aren't, again, 60-page Goliath uh, documents. What we do is we tell the key steps of the journey. Um, and, and so this is step three, and there's, there's some embedded uh, Easter eggs, and there's just gold embedded in these playbooks, because as you see at the bottom of the screen where that cursor is, Dawn and her team were able to share with us PowerPoints, Excel sheets, um, EHR screenshots, 
literally how the sausage was made, uh, agendas for their meetings when they launched this process, and they're all baked within the playbook. So the playbook isn't meant to prescriptively tell you um, these are the 98 steps you need to take. We tell you the high-level macro steps, and then we give you the tools that an organization used to achieve those, those good outcomes. And then we let you kind of um, work with those pieces, but in a way that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then throughout the playbook, you can see we have some color commentary from our characters, Don and Jen. Um, so the next slide is gonna show us um, really, this is kind of the, the result and impact slide. So these numbers in the middle are, are incredibly impressive. And this is what Dawn and her team were able to achieve before Dutank uh, even thought of working with them. So really impressive numbers and EC re ED recidivism there um, and cost savings that you can see and how many lives they impacted. So the cool part, which we can take a little credit for, um, after we worked with Dawn and her team to get that process together, we then had Dawn and Jennifer work together with us for three months. And then we launched this process at Jennifer's Hospital, a critical access hospital. Um, and you can see Jennifer's kind of comment there on the right. Before um, the individualized care plan process, which is the best practice here, uh, before that, they had three individuals who came back to their ED 59 times in five months. And then in the quarter following that, after we integrated the process, those same three individuals had only pinged back nine, nine times. And so this was a really cool exercise in us seeing how we could utilize quality improvement fundamentals uh, with human-centered design principles, take a best practice uh, from one large organization and culture and translate it to another. And so um, we've got, again, a handful of these other playbooks. And Matt, you can pop on to the next slides, what we always try and do. And these playbooks as well is to give you guys some of the tools of the trade. So some of those things that took us from an outcome and then led us uh, to where we needed to go. And I think the last slide that, that I want to touch on before I kick it over to Matt is just a, more of a teaser uh, to say that we are going to be launching very soon uh, what we're calling Quality HQ. And so this is a suite of quality improvement fundamental skills training that's online and on demand. Uh, we've got CEs connected to it. Uh, we also are offering in-person trainings, uh, but I've done a lot of quality improvement training in, in my career. And now I'm blessed to be working with Matt and the team to put together uh, a QI training course using human-centered design as the catalyst. And so um, if you're interested in any of that, or if you have quality improvement professionals or people new to quality management roles who need that competency, uh, we'd love to en engage with you there. So, so keep your eyes out for that. But Matt, I will go ahead and pass it on to you for second base for our next bin yet. Yeah. And just a, a few things, because this was a, a really great project. So thinking about the why human-centered design with this, Adam, and how it kind of fit in, in in particular. So you can see, for example, a canvas, and trust me, that's the first of many you're going to see in the next few minutes. You know, people in healthcare, and in this case, it was, you know, a clinical environment, are problem solvers, right? So it's one of the reasons why I think it's such a good fit. Every day, people are solving problems. It happens all the time. So innovation is almost a necessary part of the uh, the job description. But as many of you know, on the call, people are extremely busy and healthcare can also be notoriously siloed. So human-centered design is a really good way to take something that might exist. It could be the spark of an idea or an existing practice that exists in a small corner of the hospital somewhere. And you can use it to actually ask questions. Who's it for? Who are the stakeholders? How does it work? So we were using design in this to actually take you know, Dawn's and her internal team's thing, which was, you know, in Word documents and different kind of useful for them, but designed for them and helped, we helped make it designed for other people, right? So I think identifying and scaling best practices that already exist is, is a really great kind of application of design. And this is where the storytelling, as I mentioned earlier, really, really comes in. So You'll notice in this, so this is a tip, if you're, if you're trying to spread best practices in a design or a human-centered way, think about how do you not just share, as Adam mentioned, art guides and documents, but how do you take, create experiences for people, right? So there were a bunch of workshops involved in this, and we created experiences for people where they could talk to each other. So we structured conversations so they could learn, so they could try it on and see how it feels. Um, sometimes that link of creating transitional experiences around best practices is missing. So anyway, just, just something to, to, to think about and how design can 
uh, relate to that. So for this example, we're really, the example is going to be focused on a tool. So this is a tool you can download and we, we can share later. But uh, clinician uh, well-being and, and burnout is a really big topic. This is actually a, a you know pretty simple tool that uh, we created with the Physician Alliance and, and with the AHA. But I want to share it with you here because you, you might get use out of it. So Fundamentally, it's a really basic structure here. It's a, you know, what's commonly called a four action framework, right? So, um, you know, other versions of it that are similar, like the KISS model, like keep, improve, you know, that sort of thing. But we've got this idea of, of um, you know, what are what are activities can can be done at different levels to improve the well-being and mental health of the people that work in our in our health system. So basically, we'd have people think about, you know, what can we start doing today? What do we stop doing? What do we do more of? What do we do less of, right? Not too complicated. So here's another thing. A good design tool should be intuitive. If the tool itself is complicated and difficult to use, it's probably not well designed, right? So a lot of these things, and, and we'll just, it's a general introduction to design canvases because it's important. We, um, you can use them virtually or in person. So when we do them in person, you go to your FedEx, they cost about five bucks, um, about three feet by two feet. We say this a lot. A design canvas, which so these are main tools of the human centered design kind of trade, a design canvas is a simple structure to hold a complex conversation. That's what it is. So a big challenge for conversations when you're gathering a group of people is people kind of wait in line, metaphorically wait in line to talk. They're not always engaged, they're not always listening, and the best ideas and the, the, the kind of nuggets that, that come out aren't always captured. So we'll use post-it notes and Sharpies and, you know, pretty elementary things on these canvases. But this is an exercise that we've done many, many times with clinicians to have them share their experiences with each other, learn from each other. Because, you know, the conversations that people have with colleagues and people that have the same experiences are different than the ones they have with other folks. So, again, what can we as a system, as an industry, as a group, as a, as a unit on floor five, what do we start, stop, do more, or do less of? Simple but highly effective tool to drive teams to action. And then the other layer on this um, is thinking about at the personal level. So we'll have people do a personal reflection, like what does Matt need to start, stop, do more, do less of? And that could be very specific, you know? I need to stop parking three miles away, whatever, you know, it, it, it could be at any level. What do we need to do collectively as a system or a hospital, like an organization, if you will? And then what can we do beyond that at the system level, like kind of as an industry and as a, as a unit, you know, with a shared mission? Right. So again, just a really simple tool. Um, and usually, you know, we'll give people about 20, 25 minutes to complete it. And what's brilliant is everything that you capture, every post it note is a data point. So this is my pitch for design canvases. There's structures to help people move efficiently through conversations. There's structures that help people share and have meaningful and focused conversations. And then there are repositories or, or places to catch data. Right, so that's another thing that sometimes people miss is the utility of these things post event. So we'll often take every single post-it note and put it in an Excel sheet and crunch the data. And then you can say 63% of clinicians in our you know, system say that we need to start doing X. So these tools and things like this can actually be really effective in focus group um, discovery sessions as well. So you could have an ideal group size is four to six people. You know, You could do this with hundreds of people and then look at the data. So these things work at very different scales of population uh, as well. And here you'll see just some examples of the, the types of things that, that people might type. So again, this is the first of many, but when we talk about design, we started by talking about kind of the philosophy. Then Adam was sharing with us, like how do you engage different groups of people over time to move initiatives? This is that really narrow level of a tactical, what are the tools of the trade? So here's an, here's an example of one. And there's so many of them. And there's lots of versions of what are effectively empathy maps. So there's a classic empathy map that I believe was designed by, um, by Dave Gray and, and that team. But you'll see you know, empathy maps that face on, uh, focus on the cognitive and emotional experience, right? What do people see and hear and think and feel? And this is a more playful version of that. But this is another way that we engage clinicians is we have them talk about their profile. What keeps them awake at night? What do they dream about? What do they observe and what do they hear? And this is a great way to really understand the humans at the center of design. And speaking of tools, um, again, like we, we, it was so cool working with Jen and the team to help specifically redesign some of the approach to um, 
the, the team steps training. So we've, we've actually built some new canvases in partnership with EHA. So if you want to experience this way of working and try some of these tools out, this is a great way to do it. And one of the things about team steps, when you think about how do we have more effective communications, how do we understand each other better? These are things that have a direct impact on clin clinician well-being and frame of mind. So tools like this become the door through which you can invite people in to be part of the conversation. So they feel heard. So they see what comes out the back end is influenced by their point of view and perspective. So when we talk about designing in this way, in an inclusive collaborative way, it's not just for fuzzy reasons. You get better output and the audience that you're then presenting the ideas to feel like they've had a hand in shaping it. And when you have that sense of ownership and understanding, the likelihood that you get adoption increases, right? So that's an important, I think, point about human-centered design is the ostensible reason is to get points of view and to get better ideas. But kind of the secret reason is you get engagement, understanding, and people's fingerprints on things. Okay, so Adam, we've been doing a ton of work around diversity and health equity. I get simple structures for complex conversations. There's really complex conversations in this space. Um, so yeah, please, please share. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple things that I'd like to share uh, within the DEI space, but you know, I would posit Matt shared at the very beginning of our chat that if any field should be human-centered design, it should be healthcare. And I, I would say of the nine clouds you see on the sky here, if anyone has to be human-centered design and has to integrate empathy, it's it's DE and I. And too often we've got folks in ivory towers or rooms that are putting together strategic plans that aren't truly engaging the community uh, and those folks that they're trying to plan for. So um, let me share a couple examples of, of how we're approaching DE&I. And, and I know there's assessments out there. AHA has an amazing roadmap that if you haven't downloaded or looked at that yet or had your organization fill it out, please do. Um, they have an amazing assessment that's that's very broad reaching that spans health and racial equity. And I'm going to share a couple examples here uh, of how we're uh, targeting racial equity in, in more uh, of an intense fashion using human-centered design. And this first vignette that I'm going to talk about uh, was a one-day workshop. So we worked uh, with uh, almost 30 hospitals in Tennessee. Uh, we were in Nashville with the Tennessee Hospital Association, and we brought them together. And these were leads, uh, DEI leaders, uh, and several leaders from each team who came to the table. And the aim here was to do a one day strategic thinking workshop around DEI and what those focus areas for those organizations could be in 2023. So we held this in the summer. And so as we move on to the next slide here, uh, we'll tee up. And Matt, you can kind of click through. I know I've got a lot of clicks on these slides, so I apologize. But the first thing we did from a framing perspective was say, you know, here's our guardrails. These are the five areas that we're going to explore, dive into, discover today, from representation to all the processes within the four walls of our hospital, outside the four walls of our hospital, to how we are or aren't integrating the patient voice into our efforts, and then how we're attacking equity across the continuum. And so we started off um, on our next slide, uh, which, which you're going to see is in this eight-hour day, it was really intense. We threw five different visual canvases at folks. Um, but then at the end of the day, what we always do with these one day workshops, which are really tough, because that first vignette I talked about was nice because we had Dawn and Jennifer and the other hospitals for months. And so we could kind of indoctrinate and, and, and teach them a little bit about human centered design thinking. But when you've got 150 folks in one room for eight hours and they've never heard of human centered design or use a visual canvas, it can be a bit daunting. And so folks were tired after this day, but we aim to do four things. We wanted them to reflect upon their current organizations, their data, the perceptions of their broader team, and then to focus on something that they could do that would drive change in 2023. And then we gave them some scaffolding to plan out what that focus was going to be, and then to have a nice cogent commitment and a one pager. So whenever we do these day engagements, you know, it would be tough for you to come uh, to an engagement like this and then share with your executives back at your organization all these different post-it notes and canvases they would be like where did you go and what did you do that looks like fun but i don't understand it and so we always try and distill this down to the environment that most of us live in 
you need the elevator speech. You need the one pager that you can give to your CNO, uh, to your CMO, to your CEO and say, this is what we're committing to do and this is where we're moving to action. So uh, I'll run you through this process really quickly of each of these canvases. Uh, again, happy to share these canvases with you. This first one is in essence, a fishbone diagram for those quality improvement specialists out there, but we've applied it through human-centered design equity lenses. And so we've got those, those buckets that I talked about, representation inside the four walls of the hospital, outside, and so on. And for an hour, we had each team just spend 10 minutes on each of these buckets and to tell us your five biggest pain points or areas for opportunity within those buckets. After that, we had them uh, just check one of those areas that they wanted to drill down into for the rest of the six hours of the day. And so the next canvas, what this led us to was a very high level assessment, right? So we got to have teams self-assess themselves over the course of an hour. And then they took that big problem and they put it on our idea flip canvas. And they said, you know what, as you keep clicking, Matt, these will populate. Um, but they said CBO partnerships, one group said. And so then our challenge with this canvas was to say, okay, that's your big problem. Let's start ideating. Let's start brainstorming what a big idea could be that would really enhance or impact those CBO partnerships. And then we challenged them to think through the impact, the size of prize, assumptions and risks that they may be making. But we're doing a, a more of a vetted process here. Instead of just brainstorming and throwing spaghetti on the wall and somebody saying, ooh, that idea sounds good. We're really putting that, that rigor, that business rigor into us strategically thinking of what action steps we should take next as an organization. So after they go through this kind of rigorous idea flip, they come out with a name statement or something that they uh, want to do. And so we take them through, uh, this is our kind of bespoke improvement canvas that we've built, which is really modeled in the model for improvement. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the model for improvement, um, you have the aim statement, you have how are you going to measure it, and then what are you going to do differently? All of that is baked in here. And so we took teams through this canvas in which they got really granular and specific on what their aim was, how they were going to measure it, and then what those action steps were, uh, were going to be that were going to help them move to change in the DEI space. Um, two more canvases left. This next one, uh, and this is a really simple one, this next one, and I think there's a lot of clicks here, Matt, but this one's great because too often with improvement teams, what, what I have found too is that maybe when you're working with teams and you're focused on something like falls or readmissions, uh, people will just pick something and say, let's try that. I've got a lot of best practice around it. And there's not a lot of vetting that goes into what those change ideas are and how you should tackle them. So the matrix diagram is really simple. It allows you to line up all the different ideas you have on the left. And then you go through each row and you ask yourself these four questions. And whichever idea gets the highest score from a kind of a consensus perspective might either be your low, low hanging fruit that you, you should go for first or the most important thing you, you could do that would enact change. So a really simple structure here um, that I've seen do magic with teams, especially when they're trying to come, to come to consensus on what's that thing we should do next. And so it was really cool applying this to the DEI space. And then finally, Finally, the last canvas that we worked them through. After they got to that point and did the matrix diagram, they knew exactly what they wanted to do. They had buy-in on the team. And then we said, okay, let's make our three-month plan. So uh, what are we going to do with that idea? Um, who's going to be a part of the team? What are the action steps that are going to be taken? What are the supports that you're going to need? What are some of those barriers that you might uh, come over? And, and this is actually this game plan canvas was an integral piece of the first vignette that I shared when Matt and I did the innovation challenge playbooks. This is great because you can use color logic. Alice can have her pink sticky notes. Brian can have the purple ones. And as folks go through, it's really clear on accountability and action steps that need to take place over time. And this is just a, a beautiful visual tool. And so we did all that stuff with folks uh, in seven hours. And in the last hour, um, we said, OK, let's make this sing to folks who haven't been in this room and who haven't been writing on post-its all day. And we distilled all that into uh, the DEI project charter. So it was really cool to go into a room 
um, where nobody had kind of an idea of what was going on. And then by the end of the day, we had 26 teams with 26 charters that they were committed to for the, for the following year. So that's a, a vignette of how we've kind of done some strategic planning for DEI and in like a one day setting. The next two slides that I'll go through uh, briefly and, and happy to share these over email. Um, we're part of a really cool pilot uh, that's being led by the Commonwealth Fund. Um, and we have a, an assessment that was created by the Illinois Hospital Association, Rush University Medical Center, and the University of Chicago Medicine uh, that we're pushing out um, to hospitals actually across the world. We just had Brazil sign up and a couple other countries this morning. Um, but over the course of the next year, we're pushing this pilot out and it's through a digital hub that our team designed. Uh, it's completely free. Um, it's a it's a racial equity assessment. Um, if you if you log in and take it, you get data analytics back. We've also created a podcast space. We're having leaders from across the country that are doing podcasts for us. We're calling Equity Insights. Um, we've also got a bunch of different visual canvases each month that we're populating within the hub. The teams can download for free, like our equity fishbone diagram, that'll be in the hub. Um, something, just strategic tools that teams could use uh, to help their thinking in the DEI space. And so um, we're happy to share this link with you guys, but we encourage you to sign up for this hub if you'd like to engage in that content. And I think the next slide, Matt, just highlights um, a human-centered design playbook that we created, which everything I just talked through is uh, distilled in one way or another into these playbooks. And it's to help your teams in the DEI sector specifically reflect on your current state, on your history, on where you're at, focus on what you want to do next, put a cogent plan for that together, and then commit to that action. Um, so, so all that stuff is available through our hub, and, and we're really excited about the hospitals across the world that are that are engaging in it just in its first few weeks of being launched. So, um, Matt, with that, I'll go ahead and kick it over to you, and, and feel free to add any color commentary that I might have missed here. Yeah, just a, just a few things. So I did take a peek at the chat, so a little hard to keep up with some great comments in there. Um, one person was like, this is great, my head's spinning. We, we, we told you, we told you your head would be spinning. So again, some of this stuff, you know, just see what little bits and pieces kind of really resonate with you, you know? It's, so we're just trying to give you a high level kind of view of some applications. So what Adam just shared is very much a version of strategic planning and, and analyzing data and thinking about how you approach things. I think you know someone had a comment there, a great comment about patients and families, like the people this actually impacts, right? So this is just one of many necessary things that has to happen in this space. To be truly human-centered, you need to talk to people and understand their feelings and what their needs are and how they're impacted, right? So that is such a critical part of the process. So how do you engage patients and families? Remember a, a number of about a dozen slides ago, I showed you like an empathy map where you saw a persona. That's one of many ways you can do it, right? You can invite people in and have them build a profile or paint a picture of who they are. You can do surveys, you can do research interviews. So anytime you're designing something, right? It, yes, it's important to have good methods and good process and tools. And that's what we're showing you here. But what's probably even more important is who you invite to the party. Right. So you really need to think about how you engage your different communities. And some of these tools can be useful ways of doing it. Right. But it's it, it's imperative and critical that you, you do listen and you learn so that ultimately whatever strategies or processes, you know, all that stuff is hopefully really in service of the reality that people face every day. So um, we could talk about that for a while, but just wanted to, to share that. This is the final example um, before we. Um, you know, take a little bit of time for, for questions. So this is going to be kind of high level. I'm going to talk about a design sprint. So it's something that maybe some of you folks have, have heard before. So I don't know if it was the first example. But the first time I saw it, there's, there's a, a book by Jake Knapp about the Google design sprint. And it's an, an amazing process that happens that you run over the course of five days, five full days. The term sprint, I think, is used by different organizations very different. It's become kind of an industry term and not just specific to like five days. Uh, it's really hard to pull people out of their, their work setting for five straight days. So we've started, and lots of other groups too, talking about 30-day sprints and 60-day sprints and things like that. So anyway, it, it started as a kind of a specific term that's become a, maybe a little broader. Um, so the truly orthodox and uh, human-centered design you know, folks might be like, that's not a sprint. I don't know. Sorry, I'm nerding out on you guys here. Sorry, step, step to the side. So a sprint is kind of a method of how you can take a discrete challenge and over a period of time, try to understand the challenge, frame the problem, 
ideate a few potential solutions, design prototypes, test them, hopefully towards launch, right? So it's a process, right? So that and there's some tools that are kind of in, involved in the process. One thing that's really important, and our colleague Alex always definitely reminds us, Adam, you know, because she's a, you know, a, a great design researcher, that you have to do this research first. And this actually resonates with what we were talking about, the health equity stuff. You've got to talk to people, right? So you've got to kind of understand there's different ways that you can do that. So you have to identify who those case key stakeholders are. And they could be community members, other organizations, clinicians, et cetera, and really try to understand that. Um, it's important, of course, that you, you take that data and what you learn so that you're framing the right challenge so that you're trying to fix the right things. Because ultimately, whatever you design and build and test, it's got to create value and resonate with folks. And one of the number one things that people do wrong is they build something that nobody wants. And one of the reasons why that happens, there's no guarantee that it'll work, but you can mitigate that risk by truly understanding what people need. Right. A lot of times people act based on assumptions. Oh, I know these folks. I've got this great idea. I'm going to go to my workshop, you know, metaphorical workshop and build this thing and go to da. And then it's met with silence. Why? Because you haven't engaged people. You haven't learned about their true needs. You haven't thought about the storytelling or how people are going to adopt and things like that. So research really is that fundamental start. Right. So here's a kind of a high level, you know, kind of view of you know, what is what it looks like. So that research can be primary in terms of interviewing stakeholders, but it can also come from RL or incident data, right? It can come from other, healthcare is such a data rich environment, right? So you wanna look at the data you've got, talk to people, and then you enter the design and prototyping phase. This is a really important thing for us. You know, this is, it's not just our practice. You know, when everyone was at home for COVID, it really accelerated like in other spaces, design is no different. Uh, people's ability to work remotely. So there are incredible tools out there such as Mural or Miro, there's Jamboard. So if you're someone that's thinking about, you know, gathering a group of people and, and testing something um, and they're dispersed or you can't get everyone in sight, do explore some of those digital whiteboards as we call them. But for our work, we also leverage digital hubs. Like you might have a SharePoint or some existing technology that you could use, but we actually, a third of our team are developers actually that, that build these digital spaces. It's a huge part of our, our work and it's important when you have multiple sprint teams and large initiatives to be able to have transparency and have a central source of truth as you might call it, a place to store your resources, opportunities to have chats. Technology is really, really useful for scaling things, right? So technology, if you've got a change initiative that's aimed at 3,600 employees, technology can be really useful to kind of get the message out. So again, I think that's the topic of a whole other webinar, but you may consider leveraging digital tools. Here's just a screenshot of one of those digital whiteboards. So you can do some really cool things. It doesn't have to be the two foot by three foot printouts that I mentioned earlier, you can do this stuff digitally. And again, we talked about storytelling. You've got to think about how you're going to tell the story and, the, and it's not just the content. Good storytelling, and I think that's the topic of the third webinar in the series, if I remember correctly. So if you want to learn more, come to that. But it's about having great content. It's about if you have a team of people sharing it, being aligned so that what you're saying harmonizes with each other, and you're not contradicting each other. It's about having a good strategy. What are the channels? How are you going to reach people? Is it going to be in the newsletter, et cetera? And what's that plan, that sequence, that cadence over time, right? So a good design initiative or a good design sprint has to be wrapped around with good storytelling principles. So here's a super high level example. This is a big part of our, our work, right? So people will be like, we've got this big problem. Can you come in and run a sprint for us, right? So here's an example of one. So we worked with a health system that had multiple sites. They were, you know, there was mergers and acquisitions and different things. So there wasn't standardized systems and there wasn't standardized infrastructure. And that was a really big thing for us, Adam, that we learned that heavily influenced the design sprint. But they had a desire of like, hey, when we've got the technology X goes down, What's our backup plan? And this is around communications. How, how do clinicians you know, communicate with each other? How do we know where we're at, right? So this was kind of the, the remit of, of the sprint. So we think about the design research phase, and this is just to give you an example. So we interviewed people at the senior leadership level. We looked at that incident report data. We had masses of data from frontline surveys and things like that. So these were kind of the inputs that informed us. And then we thought about, okay, what will be necessary for us to create sustainable change that happens across a complicated system? And these are some of the things that we realized we needed. So champion support, pretty classic things, right? So stepping to the side a little bit, a design initiative or design sprint is sometimes an exercise in reverse engineering. 
In this case, it's deciding and learning up front, what do we need to be true for this thing to work? And then designing towards it. So we realized after working that we needed these four things. And then we had basically work streams that were kind of aligned to each one of them, right? So you start by understanding what's the change that you want to impact. And then, you know, then you figure out how you get there, right? So then we figured in an effort to engage these folks and get what we're looking for. What do we need to have? Processes, standardization, had to have that accountability. I'm sure your heads are really spinning right now, guys, but this is just a high level kind of, kind of view. And then you kind of mark out the progress. So this is actually, I think, a, a pretty good example of a classic design sprint. There's an understand phase. Again, the research, there's the design where you're prototyping and building some things. And those you'll see in a second here, those prototypes don't need to be tangible. They can be conceptual prototypes, right? It can just be like a process map or something. Then there's the testing phase, very important trying it out, exposing it to people, seeing what they like, what they dislike, what's missing, what's confusing, what works, right? And then iterating based on what you learn, all right? So this is really classic kind of design sprint or the design process, right? Understand, design, test, iterate. Sometimes you'll see this graphically shown in an infinity loop or a circle, so it's circular. It's not always linear, right? So you might do the research, build something, and then in the test phase, realize that it's not quite right, right? So then maybe you have to go back to the design phase and rebuild it, or perhaps you need to go back to the understand phase because you've learned that your fundamental assumptions aren't correct, right? So a lot of times you're moving forward, you're coming back, but the key is to do this kind of quickly. So another kind of innovation phrase that you'll hear often a lot is fail fast and fail cheap, right? So this is a really big challenge, I think, for us sometimes, Adam, is getting people comfortable exposing scrappy prototypes of things. There's an inclination and desire for folks to feel like it needs to be perfect before you, you know, put it out into the sunlight. And that doesn't have to be the case. So another aside here, so trying, you know, when you do the testing phase, you're also getting buy-in. You're getting people to try it out. So when people are part of it and they feel like, oh, I've tried it out and they give feedback, then the end product, they feel like they've informed in some way. So it actually lays the foundations for greater adoption. Um, what we did in this case, um, we realized that we almost had to create a prototype, if you will, like what's the fundamental structure that we need, and then we put in the content for all of them. So this might be useful uh, for you guys, if, if any of you are working on any kind of process changes or, or things like that, such as downtime. There was a procedure layer, so we need to have a plan around communications, who's gonna be accountable. Like we learned that if everybody owns it, no one does. So that was a really big learning that each site needed to nominate someone that really owned this. What is the contingency plan? This is kind of like the meat of the matter, what happens. And then this was, I think, this was really eye-opening to me, Adam, because this was a new kind of project for me, was recovery, right? So it's one thing to have a backup plan, but how do you segue back when the original thing goes back online? I think a lot of times that's missing, right? So it's one thing to think about, oh, X fails, do Y, but what happens when X comes back up? Like, how do you revert, right? So the recovery plan was a really important part of the procedure. And then there was the policy layer, right? How do you make this durable? How do you make sure that it's a shared best practice? And this involves having strong policies. Education, sometimes, right, with processes, and maybe many of you can relate to this, you come on board, you've got two days of onboarding and you're just swamped with stuff and you can't remember anything. Um, so how do you have ongoing education, testing, et cetera? So I'll move on in the, I know we're running out of time, but each uh, hospital actually built a prototype and they tested this, they shared it with folks. Do you agree with the policy, what works, what doesn't, et cetera. And then classic design sprint stuff. Once you go through understand design, then you might get into an execute phase, which is kind of scaling it and that sort of thing. So anyway, there's a lot there, folks. Um, Adam, anything quick to add to, to that? No, no, I don't. We've got a lot of good comments in the chat I'm trying to tackle, um, but no. I, so I'll just take 30 seconds here. So you saw th four of many areas that you can apply it. And just a quick recap, you can use human-centered design to fundamentally improve outcomes and experience, enhance quality, spread best practices. Remember that first example? enable inclusion and co-creation, depending on who you bring. This can be a mechanism for hearing voices and having people join the discussion. Uh, you can, an extension of that, you know, use it to think about things that can actively be done to increase well-being and reduce burnout, design, test, scale, new product services and processes, right? Okay, so again, <laughs> there's a lot of these tools on that hub, you know, feel free to check it out. 
And uh, do feel free to email us as well. We're always happy to talk about this stuff. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate that rapid fire introduction to human centered design thinking. Um, yeah, the common, uh, you know, some of the comments where people's heads were spinning, but what the good news is, is there's two more webinars that will take a bit more of a deeper dive and a focus into um, certain areas, especially with patient and family engagement. Um, so I just want to thank you for your time. Um, we might be able to get to a question or two, but I do want to handle a few business items. So if you can go to the next slide, um, that would be great. So um, just before I get into this, please know that we will send a follow-up email with the webinar recording, and we will also include some of the links that Matt and Adam referenced. So we'll send that to all webinar registrants uh, by the end of the week. Uh, once we actually close out this, this webinar, um, an event evaluation will appear on your screen. We really value your feedback. So please, please fill that out. And finally, I'll leave the CE um, information up here uh, on the page while we, while we kind of come to a close here. So I'm going to ask a hard question, but we're just going to go with it. So, um, you know, Adam, Matt, you, you posed the question at the start, what is that challenge? What is that opportunity for improvement that um, you kind of tasked folks with thinking about? So if they have that in mind, where do they start? <laughs> where where could you send them or what would you recommend um kind of some next steps with uh some of the tools or some of the approaches that you you highlighted here in your case examples so yeah i'll take a first step jeff um my head goes to to one place because you remember the slide that matt had where we talked about human-centered design and pace and business rigor and storytelling so whatever your problem is those components should be integrated into it. And the website that we shared that has a bunch of our tools that are free for download, I would then challenge you after listening to this today, whatever your problem is, there's probably a human-centered design canvas on there that could apply to how you could maybe um, have more empathy for that patient population or your key stakeholder internally. And as Matt said, these canvases um, the nice part about this work is you don't have to be lean or Six Sigma or certified or go have a master's in this stuff to do it. If it's designed the right way as a tool, you should be able to lay it in front of somebody and tee it up in a minute. So my challenge would be regardless of what that problem is, take a look at some of the visual canvases and pontificate if one of those might be good for download just to be a simple structure to hold a complex conversation with a patient or with another external member. Um, that's where my head goes first. Real quick, start with the start with the people. So go back to the origin of human-centered design. Start with the humans. Who are the cast of characters in your challenge? Maybe use an empathy map, ask them questions, bring them to the table. Do not jump to solution. Mm. Great yep. point. That's awesome. That's a that was a loaded question. So apologies, but <laughs> thanks for thanks for handling that. Um yeah, I'll just I'll just advocate that. Um yeah, I love the stakeholder or the empathy map canvas. Um it really helps, um, especially if you're thinking about in, patients. In I just want to tell you, there's such great stuff in this comp in the chat box that we didn't get to around governance and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So I just want to commit to everybody. Matt and I are going to read all these and we'll ensure to kind of hit on some of the questions you guys have raised today, which are phenomenal questions that we could talk about for hours, but we only have a minute. So I just want yeah. to let you know, and we're committed to circling back on all the stuff in the next webinar. Future webinars, yeah. yeah, thanks. I was just going to say, um, there's two more webinars in this series. So if you liked today and want to hear more, please do sign up for our February and March webinars where we'll go into more detail and we can also take some of the comments and questions here um, and bring that into the next webinar as well. So there's a bit of continuity there. But um, given that we only have one minute, I really want to thank uh, Matt and Adam for, for leading this webinar today and being great partners of, of AHA team trainings. Um, thanks for showing a little bit of a preview about the updated Team Steps Master Training course and some of the design thinking tools and principles that we have embedded into, into that curriculum, especially for day two, which is really about understanding, you know, the problem or opportunity for improvement and the why behind things and who our key stakeholders are and how we're going to move change ahead. So um, with that, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, any questions, please email us at teamtraining at aha.org. And then like Matt said, feel free to reach out to, to do tank directly. And we hope to see you next month. Thanks, everyone.